Hampshire Unscripted with your host, Ray Dudley. Have a Mac SE behind you? I do. <laughs> that was the my com, my first computer. Well, my second computer after the uh, Radio Shack. Um, I forget what that was. Something eighty eight hundred. I don't know. Yeah. And we still have that in our garage, and it's what I used all through college. And it works. It's functioning. Oh, really? Yeah. What can yeah, you do it? For- uh, it fires up. It's got a little uh, floppy disk with some games on it. You could play Castle, um, what's it called? Dark Castle? I, ever- I never played Dark Castle. But- oh, what do you use game. it for? You can't connect it to the internet. <laughs> I wouldn't want to try anyway. So, No, I just have it. I, I, um, I used it years ago and just keep it. You know, it's, an, I don't know, antique. Yeah. That- yes, it is. Yes. I like your poster wall behind you. Thanks. Thanks. Hope to get some more up there. My uh- wife keeps doing that, but. She's uh, into nostalgia. So if I pass away, she has plenty of memories. Well, you know, you did say that, you know, you're hesitant to get back on except for something that's like really challenging and meaningful to you, like True was. Yeah. And so I got to feel like that means you got to come out for our town because that, that's like the best role out there for, you know, guys of a certain genre. Well, I, hey, I know that it's. James Whitmore played it. There's Paul no Newman. Angry section, though. What's that? There's no anger yeah, it's section. Yeah, good for your heart. He's, <laughs> a, he's the calm guy. Well, we'll find out if I've taken care of some of that. Um, I don't know. No, we haven't tested it yet, but we, we may. So let's chat about, um, I don't care where you want to start. Um, what's more important to you? You want to talk about powerhouse? You want to talk about the mill or the colonial? What do you want to? They're sort of all interconnected. Yeah, it's all inter- interconnected. So we could tell you just about what we're doing and how it how it connects the mill and the colonial together. Good. Fire away. Start wherever you want. Okay. So should we introduce ourselves? Where are you gonna you gonna you want to introduce? Well, everyone knows first? you. Why would I have to do that? Not everyone <laughs> knows us. I'll put it in the intro. <laughs> okay. You can make an intro. Okay. Well, thanks for having us, Ray, on your podcast show. It's good to be here. <laughs> Great, Good to great. see your smiling face. Yeah, thanks, thanks. And and we can't. You're you. We appreciate that you wore your fluorescent shirt so that we didn't want you to be able to. I didn't want you to miss me with all the yeah, we wanted, on the background. You know, in the two Zoom boxes, we you there's we we might have lost you, but now there's no way we can lose you. So we know. Uh, I know. I know. Too. It's why I have my name in my underwear in case I get lost <laughs> on the street. So smart, always thinking. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> so yeah, so we're here to tell you about Powerhouse Theater Collaborative, our new. Uh, community theater group and uh, how uh, it relates to the Belknap Mill and the Colonial uh, that's being com- soon to be completed in downtown Laconia. So well, when you say soon, I might as well start there. What does soon mean? Good question. Um, so the Colonial Theater um, has been undergoing a major renovation. Yep. Um, it is a theater that was built in 1914. It is being brought up to modern standards while keeping all of the important historical um, interior. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous inside. I can't wait for people to see it. Um, It should be done in the next month or so. Um, COVID has, you know, um, set them back a a little bit, but not too badly. Um, And of course, um, being finished doesn't mean necessarily open. We have to wait until it's safe to do that, but, um, but it should be soon. So who are the backers for this? So this project was funded by the Belknap Economic Development Council and the city of Laconia. They worked together and uh, found a whole bunch of different funding sources. Um, and you know, this is a project that started in like 2015 you know, in the planning phases and it took a while to get uh, for them to raise the money um, to get it actually done. And then of course, as they started construction last year, that's when COVID hit to slow things down some more. Um, but it, you know, so it's a, been a, a, in the works for about five or six years now. It's been a big collaborative project. There was a lot of you know, local support and then you got the Economic Development Council in the city and then they applied for grants. There's a lot of historic 
um, tax credit funding that um, allows them to refurbish all the natural or all the beauty that was in there before the original beauty. Um, so it was a very complicated puzzle piece of funding sources that they finally got all the pieces to fit together properly and were able to get it done. But the nice part about that for us is we didn't have to deal with any of that. (laughs) Our job is simply to talk about how it might be used and, uh, and what could be put in there once it was finished. So how did you guys get um, involved? How did they get it? Why, why and how? So David Bounds, who you know uh, well, the, the late Laconia city council councilor, um, you know, he knew us from our years of doing theater with him. And he was, as a city councilor, on the planning committee for uh, planning the renovation and, uh, and the programming for it when, uh, when it was finished. And David asked us to join that committee, you know, five or six years ago now at this point. Um, so we were there as a, you know, to give a perspective of how uh, with our background in the Lakes Region art scene, you know, we've had uh, daughters and, and been involved in dance companies. We obviously have a theater background. We knew a lot of the different arts groups in the area. So we were helping them first figure out sort of the architectural needs for making a modern theater that would be useful to the various groups who might want to rent it or, or perform there. And then, um, you know, further down the line, thinking about how, how the, um, Colonial might be managed and operated. Um, so we were in and out um, of that committee for you know the last five or six years. There were times when it was very active, and then there were you know a year or two when they were just working on finding the funding where we didn't you know weren't involved much at all. And then finally the funding fell into place, and then then they came back to us to start talking to them about helping them figure out programming. Does it have a uh, like a one purpose or is it like a multi-purpose kind of thing? Is it, what, what are they hoping to do? <laughs> um, I think, I think the initial, the initial idea was this should be as flexible a space as possible, but it is a, you know, so they want it to be able to be used for, you know, having your rotary club presentation to having a dance troupe to having a, um, you know, touring, a, a, a concert touring or yeah, comedians. comedians, things like that. So if you want to think about it in terms of um, it's a little bit like the Capital Center for the Arts and a little yeah. bit like the City Auditorium in Concord. Got they it. wanted both sort of styles of program. They want it to be usable uh, uh, to the local arts groups who might want to perform there and rent it. And they also wanted to have national touring acts come through that would, uh, you know, bring people to downtown Laconia, you know, throughout the year, depending on what was what was going on. They wanted to because if you think about it, um, the Economic Development Council really wants to revitalize, you know, bring lots of people to to downtown and the city invested money as well. And so that means they want it available to city residents. And that means both as patrons and as users of the facility. So they want to make it available to local groups to rent as well. So your function is what? You're going to try to bring in groups or you're going to just oversee what's going on? So we're actually just going to be overseeing our program. Um, So what happened was when it got down to finally um, figuring out what the programming would be, uh, David and the city came back to us and said, you know, what would you guys do with it if you were involved? And we said, you know, the first thing we do is we'd start a community-based arts program because it's you know less expensive to produce than having to pay for you know national touring acts to come in and it would really function as the heart of the building which is making it useful and usable for local people to perform there um, so we said we'd start with a locally based arts program which they really liked but they also wanted um, you know to have national touring acts coming through so then spectacle management came on board and approached the city and said, hey, we're interested in maybe managing this theater and we'd be interested in bringing in national touring acts and comedians and things like that. But we really wanna have a community component. And the city said, oh, hey, you guys should talk to each other. So they put us in touch with each other. And um, so the city hired um, spectacle to manage the building and they'll be They'll be keeping the calendar, um, bringing in their own um, staff. Pr- program and, and staff and, and not producing, but bringing in 
um, acts. And then they asked us to be the resident theater company to have some baseline community-based programming. So, so does that give you a permanent slot each year? Yeah. So, so as the resident theater company, we have an agreement with Spetsco that we get five production weeks a year to do with what, what we want. So, um, so we sort of get first dibs on the calendar um, before it gets opened up to the uh, other groups who want to use it to sort of lock it, make our season plan, and then they'll schedule around that. And that, you know, what we really liked when we met with Spectacle was, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, for-profit company from Massachusetts whose business is managing venues and booking acts. That's what they do. But they also, as Johanna said, really felt that for the Colonial to be successful, there needed to be a community component to it that got the local people excited and wanting to also come, you know, see the acts that Spectco was bringing in, but that felt kinship to it because, you know, they see their neighbors on stage or they get on stage themselves or, or whatnot, all the good things that community theater, you know, brings to, a, brings to an area. And so, yeah, so we have a partnership with them where we're sort of their liaison to the local community. So we've been introducing them to some of the other arts organizations and, you know, we'll, we'll be able to provide them, you know, sort of guidance and feedback on how to navigate sort of the local waters and things like that. Um, and so it's really a nice blend of, we get to focus on what our strengths and our passions are. They get to focus on what their, you know, what their business model is based on and they complement the skill sets complement each other very nicely and allow us to, each sort of use the venue in our own way, uh, collaboratively and cooperatively, but providing the local audience very different types of entertainments. So is there any chance of, is there overlap with like what's going on in Concord or, or any other place? Is there a chance that you're going to cannibalize audiences from other groups? Well, we're, so we should also mention that um, we're associated with the Belknap Mill and we're a program under the Belknap Mill and we called ourselves Powerhouse Theater Collaborative. Powerhouse comes from the powerhouse that was at the Belknap Mill that um, created energy you know, for the actual mill and actually had excess energy that powered downtown Laconia. So we want to power the arts in Laconia and we called ourselves Collaborative because we plan to work with a lot of other groups. And so we already have several programs that we're doing with um, Community Players of Concord. Um, we have collaborations planned with um, uh, Jeans Playhouse. NCCA at Jeans mm -hmm. Playhouse in London. Um, and so, um, you know, whenever you put something on, of course, you know, on, a, on a, any given weekend, there's a limited audience that has to see both. But I think there's going to be such a range of programming um, throughout the year that I, I don't think I don't think we'll be cannibalizing. We, we plan to try to work together with other groups as much as possible. Yeah. Have you had any feedback from like Capital Center for the Arts? Are they concerned at all? Any groups like that? Um so they wouldn't be concerned about our part of this because we're just essentially, a, you know, a community theater group that's setting up shop at a, a, as, you know, as a resident company. Um, I think, you know, they may, you know, their, their programming is more in line with the types of events the spectacle will be bringing in. But so know, I would leave that question. Yeah, spectacle. I would leave that question alone because that's not really our, our, <laughs> our, 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 our side of it. But, you know, right. like anything, you know, any new venue is going to obviously attract eyeballs as it's new and shiny as an ex and exciting. And it's, you know, it's how the programming connects with the local populace is, is, is whether it succeeds long term or not and builds it. Builds and, you a know, for following. example, the Belknap Mill um, has a mission of, of arts and culture and being sort of a community center. And they have a big focus on the arts and we're gonna be their theater wing, but they have other types of arts programming. And so I think the idea is you've got the Colonial, you've now got a new venue in Lakeport, um, you know, down the road, there's um, Chaos and Kindness is opening something as well. I think the idea is you bring arts to the more arts to the region and it just, becomes a arts destination and a place where people go to look for things. So interestingly, so our, we should, we sort of didn't totally finish the story. So, uh, and talk, explain how the mill inter, in, in, intercepts with this plan. 
So Jahan and I were, were theater artists and residents at the mill last year where we were doing some uh, very small you know, play readings and stuff at the mill that were designed to just present in interesting works and then provide talkbacks and, and discussion about the plays. Um, and once it was decided that Spectacle was going to be the manager of the Colonial, then and we were going to be a community theater portion of it. That's when we decided um, to go back to the mill and discuss with them just expanding our program to continue what we were doing already at the mill and then add to add larger, larger scale productions to the colonial slate. And it worked really well because it's right in line with, as Johanna was saying, the mill's mission, which is basically to be a, a community and cultural uh, hub of, of of downtown the history and art so now we're pairing the colonial from 1914 which was you know a, a, a entertainment center for um for downtown laconia with the belknap mill which was built i think 1823 which was you know is representative of sort of the industrial heritage of the of the lakes region and putting these two venues together to become sort of a a dual powerhouse if you will of of arts and culture in downtown laconia um, and so it pairs very nicely and allowed us to just uh, keep what we were doing at our mill and then grow that at the mill and then grow that into programming at the Colonial as well. So each year we're planning a, a Colonial series and a mill series. And, uh, you know, we'll have a slate of, the, of four or five big things at the Colonial and four or five smaller things at the mill and at Rotary Park. So what um, what's the time frame for you guys? When's your first production or in either house either the the mill or the colonial so we're already got two things in rehearsals for the mill series um in the fall i did a playwriting workshop with uh, a bunch of people in it and the the point of the workshop is to come out with you know 10 to 15 minute plays to that could be produced so um we have a zoom festival in april and then a park festival in may so uh, some of the plays Park. were written specifically to be performed on Zoom. They were, mm. you know, taking this class during the pandemic. And so some of them chose to write plays that were specifically designed to be on Zoom. And the other ones wrote plays that were specifically designed to be performed in a park, another place that we thought would be a safe um, place for people to perform. So we've already had auditions for those. And there's over 30 people in each of the two festivals, which is a great you know, we're very excited mm -hmm. to start off with something that so many people are are involved in. And some have had to do with, you know, getting people interested to audition for new works that they never heard of is sometimes hard. But yeah. I think so many people were just looking for something theatrical to do that was safe that a lot of people came out. But we're, you know, really excited that we got off to a good start with that. And then our first Colonial production is scheduled for August, assuming it's safe to open a big indoor venue by August. What's um, the feedback on that? Are, are you getting anything from the state on when you may, when they might let you do that? I think the state really, it, you know, it, it goes in small chunks. So I don't think we can look that far ahead. I mean, mm -hmm. right now it looks like the trends are trending that, that it would be safe, but you know, it's impossible to know with the variants and who knows what's coming down the pipe. So we've been, so. In, we're, we're in talking with spectacle about, you know, making sure that we, we don't, you know, have the grand opening. There may be some smaller sort of socially distanced, uh, soft opening events, mm -hmm. but we've been talking to Spectral about making sure, you know, the grand opening doesn't happen when, until it's safe to bring 700 people into, it's a 750 seat theater. You don't want to have your grand opening with 50 people in it when, uh, yeah. versus waiting until it's safe to bring more people in and have a big 750, celebration. that's huge, huge. So you know, it is it is big. It actually used to have, I believe, 1400. 1400. Um, but with new guidelines about, you know, aisle widths and seat sizes and things like that, it's it's pared down. But um, but it doesn't feel that huge. It's a really lovely, intimate space. You never feel like you're really far from the uh, from the stage. Um, it's just we can't wait for people to get in there and see that it feels really for such a large venue, it feels very interesting. Yeah, that, that's one of the things I liked the best about it. Because um, I was worried, you know, you know us, we're, we're used to programming in small intimate venues, um, a lot of the stuff we've done over the years. And the thought of 700 seats, you know, was a little off putting. And then we got into it and realized, this doesn't feel like a big theater. It, it holds a lot of people, but it feels like an intimate space. 
Um, so I, I felt more comfortable saying, oh, you can do a play in here and it's not going to feel like, oh, you're just looking at little tiny people way in the distance and hearing them out of a speaker. Yeah. Um, so, so it really is, a, 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 we think is going to be a, a jewel of a little theater to be able to fit so many people, but still feel a, a, a close connection between audience and, and stage. Did you guys have any input on like the sound, lighting, any of that stuff for the Colonial? In, in our limited um... in our little <laughs> limited expertise, we, we, we've we uh, foisted that duty off more to people who understand that stuff a lot better than we do. But, you know, what we knew, what we were able to tell them was, here's the basics of what a community theater program or a dance recital or something might need. You know, not the specific model per se, but, you know, what types of stuff we'd be looking to do in it so that they could you know, pick the appropriate equipment. And I should say they had a um, theater consultant um, oh, that worked with the architects as well. And Mishashik Turpin were the architects um, from downtown Laconia. And um, we, we and stayed in our lane as much as possible <laughs> to what we were, you know, we were confident in and, and passed off uh, the responsibility for the stuff we don't know as much about to people who, who knew what they're talking so about. So have you been in there? Have you tested the acoustics and seen what type of lighting and all that that's well, actually, going Actually, they just put, they haven't put the lights in yet, but they just put the speakers in and you can look on Facebook at the Colonial, Colonial Laconia. Laconia. Facebook yeah, Facebook page. And I don't think you'll be disappointed if you want sound in the speakers that they put in so, there. <laughs> it's quite an array. So if you think about it, they're, they're outfitting it both for local groups to be able to use, but also for, you know, big concerts, you know, touring concerts and things to come through. And their spectacle specialty is music acts. So they're, you know, speaker wise, it's going to be designed to be able to do, a, you know, a really good high quality sounding indoor concert. Um, we were a lot more focused on, you know, what the lighting capabilities would be and, and making sure that, um, you know, theatrical lighting would be uh, what they were the package they're putting in was amenable to that as well and it um, seems like a great package that with with the way lights have come in the last you know bunch of years there's lots of led movable fixtures LED. so you can have all kinds of colors in one light and it moves and you can program it so i think i think the lights people will be happy with the light so they have green rooms and everything well, so the, the backstage stuff is a little more limiting than some of the other other things. Like from the audience perspective, it's going to be amazing. There's going to be, you know, a lot more bathrooms than there were in 1914 and <laughs> wider aisles and comfortable seats. Um, but theaters back then were designed differently. And, and, you know, wing space and backstage space is much tighter than, you know, uh, oh, that if you were designing a building from scratch, you know, a theater from scratch today, you'd put more peripheral space in it. I know um, he and I disagree on this because I've been in old theaters and I think that as old theaters go, this one has really nice um, space. It, it, they took an they took entire section of a block on the side street next to the theater and incorporated it. Well, that was the original. Yes, it, it was incorporated. It was once incorporated. It had been unincorporated and they reincorporated it. So there's these lovely, sunny rooms that are right off of the stage, right next to bathrooms. There's a kitchen, um, there's showers. I think it's going to be, you know, it might not be traditional um, it's not so dressing that room space in that, you know, everyone has their little cube and there's you know, mirrors and lights, but I think it's going to be, for most people, it'll be a nice. It, it's a nice set place. up as multi-purpose space. I mean, mm -hmm. they want people to be, have rehearsals back there. They want groups to have meetings back there. They want catered events to happen back there. So they put in the kitchen, oh, um, you know, it's multifunctional space. So people will sort of just have to adapt to use it as dressing room and green room and all these things at once. There's also space under the stage as well. It's not, um, you know, polished and finished, but it's, it's usable space as well. Hmm. So um, is it like the backstage space? Is it kind of like the Audi where there's like none? <laughs> yes, but what it, it doesn't have that, you know, three story addition, you know, section with all the dressing rooms stacked on top of each other. And one nice thing is that the fly system is um, motorized. So oh, there's sweet. not a huge, there's not a huge rail anywhere, you know, rack of, of fly. Yeah. You know. About 90 miles of rope. Yes, it's all, all going to be automated and uh, I think controlled by the light board and stuff like that. It's, it's going to like, 
it, that's the thing about it, it's a very ornate old fashioned theater. There's, you know, gilded cherubs along the face of the balcony and, you know, gold leaf proscenium and things like that. I have that. that on my house. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so it, it's very old fashioned in that regard, but it's going to be outfitted with completely up to date, modern, you know, lighting, sound, flies, you know, et cetera. Right. So it, it'll be a nice, a nice mix of feeling like you get a sense of what it would like to be in that theater in 1914, but be able to have the comforts uh, and the modernity. And a, a shout Brooklyn. out to the people that, um, who was a company from Brooklyn who did all the repainting of everything they really did an amazing job we'd been in there when it was crumbling away and there were giant pieces of plaster missing and now you go in and you can't even tell what's new and what's old and they had to they even recreated um some original stuff that they knew was there originally but that had been painted over and they sort of you know figured out what was there and brought it back a lot of detailed paint work yeah, this company spent like a year just doing all the detailed historical painting to restore it to how it was. Like the entire ceiling has been repainted like leaf by leaf, uh, panel by panel. It's quite ornate and quite beautiful. Yeah. I guess they're hoping to get a lot of restaurants and stuff in there too, right? That, that complement the theater? Sure. I mean, they, you know, they're, the city is certainly looking at the Colonial to be the sort of the anchor point for attracting a lot of new business and a lot of new traffic to downtown. That's, that's why the city and Belknap EDC invested in it, because they thought it could be the hub of, of you know, a downtown, you know, revitalization. And, and uh, there already has been in the last few years since they announced it, a lot of new business is coming into Laconia with the, you know, anticipating that the colonial opening, it's, you know, would, would eventually bring more traffic to the area. Yeah, good. I hope it does. I mean, it's pretty dead down there right now, except for tattoo parlors and barbershops. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, if you, if you're downtown on a Saturday night, there is not much open. You're right about that. But and it's looking nicer and nicer. Stuff. And, um, and there's some very nice barbershops down there. I, would say too. <laughs> and, I wasn't trying to disparage. <laughs> <laughs> but they look really nice. I'm just saying the the level the level of the of the kind of shine on the businesses has definitely gone up in the past. Yeah. And the mill actually also is in the middle of a capital campaign and already completed a phase where they redid their um, per, their performing space, their event space on the third floor of the mill. Yeah. So it's got all new lighting, all new floors. It's still got the beautiful exposed brick. So we're, we're the lucky ones to sort of get to take advantage of these two spaces, um, you know, both recently renovated that, you know, hopefully our part in it will be, you know, throughout the year, you know, with eight to 10 events going on a year, our, our part will be bringing people to come check out these new spaces and, and become a part of the mill, become a part of the colonial and, uh, you know, the Colonial will, ha will have ways, the Colonial is going to have part-time, you know, event-related staffing opportunities, as well as volunteering opportunities for ushering and things like that. Um, the Mill is a community member-driven, driven nonprofit, so there's always ways for people to get involved there. So the more events that are happening at both buildings, the more people are coming to Laconia and doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... The mill is an interesting place. Um, it, it doesn't actually have a stage. Is there, I mean, because I've seen the readings there, but are, are you hoping to have a stage eventually? What, what do you want to do there? The, the plan for the mill is basically to do things that are more about um, in, interesting plays that provoke discussion. I mean, keep, it's going to be obviously an intimate experience to be in a, a venue that size to do a play. And uh, so our plan for there is mostly like workshops and reading type things rather than full scale productions. Okay. It's certainly possible. I mean, they did, they did just recently, um, you know, they have a flexible staging system that we can put in, but um, sometimes it's just nicer to be on the floor and um, have you I, had other groups reach out to you to work with you? I mean, besides the players in Concord? Uh, we, we have to, not theater groups, but we actually have. So, so as Johanna mentioned, we put collaborative on our name was we, we see our sort of role at the um, colonial as sort of 
even though we are not managing the calendar or dealing with the rentals and stuff, we sort of see our role as being sort of spectacles liaison to the rest of the arts community in the lakes region. Um, we've already had an event where we hosted a Zoom meeting to introduce spectacle to the different arts organizations. So representatives got on the Zoom and we, we us and spectacle told them about the plans for the colonial and wanted to hear from them of how their groups might want to use it. And, um, and we also want to leverage our access to the colonial to allow other, other people than just you know, necessarily theater people to use it. So uh, I'll give you an example where we're talking to all the dance studios in the Lakes region about putting some joint theater dance event together for like you know, a one day, you know, we're calling it, right now we're calling it a winter dance extravaganza, but you know, that, that <laughs> title is subject to change. But you know, where, where each, each dance company performs a few numbers and we maybe perform some music acts or things like that. And we provide a, you know, a low cost ticketed event um, that gets a whole bunch of different dance kids on stage um, and things like that. We're talking to the Lakes Region Symphony Orchestra about doing some kind of joint production with them, using them as the orchestra and, and us for the, the musical theater actors. Uh, we're talking to all the different high schools in the Lakes Region about us sort of being the producer for a joint high school production where we pick a piece that can be segmented and each school works on their own piece but then we bring all the kids together for a production week, uh, you know, to put a, a, a whole product together made up of these pieces. So we're trying to be, we're, we're you know, we're, we, we haven't done a lot yet. Um, so we haven't worked with a lot of theaters yet, but our plan is working not just with theaters, but schools, historical societies, civic groups, you know, all kinds of groups. I don't know how your heads don't explode. I mean, you, this is getting bigger. You were busy, so busy before this. It's not like it's not like you just had you know these spare blocks of time that oh yeah why don't we just stick in a new theater group start that and contact the state everyone get our list out and just start hitting up dance groups and geez well that's that's been fun and actually that's been a uh, uh, that's been a, a good way to sort of see the communities interest in the colonial and it, and it, and it being brought back to life. Um, you know, we, we started looking for sponsors for our 2021 productions and the businesses we talked to were so excited about what's going on and want to see this coming back. So we felt a lot of just in the, in the numbers of conversations we've been having so far with different people, you know, we feel really good that we, we're going to provide something that people are going to be excited about and why Johan and I got into theater is we wanted to do theater that, you know, meant something to our community and helped build community. And by tying the mill and the colonial together, by working with other types of artists, you know, we're really, really excited to see what we can do that really makes the colonial, um, you know, a, a place that the Lake Street community has, a, you know, a lot of affection for wants to support, um, you know, provides a lot of value and, and uh, good things into their lives. So this is, this, this program I think is, you know, we've been theater nomads for a while. We had our other theater company before that at the Playhouse. And, you know, I think this is really uh, giving Johanna and I an opportunity to find all the best parts of theater that we like to do and, you know, put it into sort of one community-based program um, that touches a lot of different types of theater and types of performing arts and brings them all together. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, talk about dance groups. Have you ever been in Concord when they've been having their festivals down there? My God, it's amazing how, what kind of traffic that pulls in there. Well, spectacle in the other venues it manages is very, um, very aware of those types of, you know, big dance events. But uh, interestingly, again, uh, this thing that we proposed to these dance companies, one of the reasons we proposed it was, you know, we know all the, a lot of these companies have these competition teams that goes to these, you know, sort of big pageanty events where that, you know, they're in competition for trophies and stuff. Yeah. And we said, wouldn't it be nice to you know, work together on an event that's not comp competitive, that's collaborative. And, you know, you all get to show your own piece of it, but we're all working together to put on this event um, that you know the audience can enjoy. And we can have a, a educational component and have a master class where kids from different schools and different you know dance studios work together on a piece and they would not have had the chance to, to do that 
um, except, you know, in this type of collaborative event. So. Yeah, it's amazing how comprehensive that could potentially turn out to be. Um, yeah, I mean, we're a little worried, you know, uh, I th we think the colonial calendar is going to get filled up pretty quickly. And, you know, we've got our, our five weeks and then, gosh, you know, there may be a lot more opportunities than just five to, you know, come up with things to do in, in this in this space year after year. Yeah, but Ray's right. We only have so much time. <laughs> we're we're going to we're going to get a we've been spoiled in that, obviously, this last year. There's been a lot of extra time to do things, that, and so yeah. we've made a lot of big plans, and now executing them, um, you know, that's the next step. But you know, she always worries about stuff like that. <laughs> I rather find things to do, but I also keep reminding her, like the the the, the types of productions <laughs> we're putting into the mill don't take the same amount of time as doing a big production, you know, uh, you know, directing a big musical at the Colonial. So even though we have a lot of events to offer the public not all of them are equal in terms of how much of our time they take. And that's the nice part about being able to do the big things and the small things. You know, the small things allow, you know, allow us to have other events to offer the public that, you know, aren't interested in a big musical, but do want to hear about the, you know, this, this play that, you know, touches on, you know, uh, immigration or the climate or something that we can then have a good, you know, community discussion about. Yeah. So we can offer things like that at the mill where it's not prohibitively expensive to put it on for us. And, you know, the people who are interested in that type of theater, that's maybe a little more thought provoking or something that's new that we couldn't sell in a 750 seat theater, we could still do those little interesting things and pull in our actor friends who, uh, you know, want to work on something like that. And it doesn't take a huge amount of our time. So we still have plenty of time to work on the big thing that's going on, you know, six weeks later at the Colonial. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, small theater groups that don't have a space to to work in I, are you thinking or hoping at some point to bring them in to to work in the mill um i'm, I'm kind of thinking of uh groups like lend me a theater i mean they just don't have any home and mm -hmm. they could maybe use a space like that to rehearse or i mean there's no space around right yeah so no <laughs> the answer to that question is no um so that's one of the reasons that our our model with a limited budget can work is that being the resident company of both the mill and the colonial, if one of them isn't available for rehearsal, the other one probably is, you know. So we could work on something jointly, but we probably couldn't yeah, give up our Yeah, our I mean, we, you know, <laughs> and, and also don't forget, I mean, we're a part of the mill and the colonial, so we're the home, you know, sort of the home group. But, you know, both of these venues are rental venues that are designed to, you know, if other groups want to rent the space, that that's what the, you know, that's how and they both make have some income to sustain nonprofit themselves. rates and, you know, ways that they could work with groups. So too. But I mean, a theater like Lend Me a Theater could certainly rent the Colonial for a week to put up their show there. Um, you know, that the Colonial calendar will be open to, you know, any group that can, you know, work with them and come up with, a, you know, they'll have a rental rate and package to offer. But, um, but do you yeah, have right. any fear that the community theater side of it could eventually get squeezed out at at the Colonial? Yeah. Well, at least not for the not, you know, for the length of our contract period. But you know, one thing I think to remember, and this is something Spectacle you know told us when we first met with them because we were a little unsure how the pieces would fit together. That in you know in a venue that they manage. They're usually, you know, if it's a very active venue, they're booking 30 to 35, you know, one night events a year, you know, that leaves a lot of weekends open for other things to happen. Um, and, you know, they're not going to be starting at the Colonial going right to 30 events a year. They need to assess what the market is like and what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of events sell well here. Um, you know, they, so, so I think, Long term, it really all depends on what's successful. I, I like to believe that our community theater is going to become such a big part of it that it's going to be integral to the success of the venue staying open because we're filling five, you know, at least five weekends a year. Yeah. Um, and we're bringing a lot of people there. Um, you know, not every show, but we're looking for shows. You know, in general, the colonial shows. You know, we're hoping are you know twenty people and up, and we've got some shows on our on our plans for the next few years that could have like 50 people in them. Um, so, 
we'll not only be able to provide high quality community theater where, you know, the, the real serious community theater actors who want to do high quality work come out and, you know, vie for the leads, but also shows where somebody who just wants to see what theater is like or really loves that play because they read it in high school and, you know, there's an ensemble and they're going to be in the ensemble and get the experience and feel good about being a part of it and don't have to be a star for it to be, to add something to the overall uh, component and get something out of it that's satisfying and, and you know, makes them feel like it was time well spent. So where do you see Powerhouse in like five years? What's your, your hope there and goal? You want to stay at the mill? Is that what, what your ultimate? I mean, right now, I think, I think it's a great, it's a great partnership. Um, we're fulfilling their mission. Um, and we're adding, you know, they have a very robust program. Um, we're launching a new website with them on the 17th of March. And when you go to it, you'll see they just have so much going on. And this just adds another layer. So I think that's a really great partnership. So I think for the foreseeable future, um, you know, unless the program gets too big to be under their banner, I don't see why we wouldn't stay there. Yeah, we, we constantly talking about how between Spectacle, The Mill and us, it's really a win-win-win. Um, you know, the relationship uh, um, with us being you know based at the mill, but uh, but a key component of both facilities really is benefits all of us. Um, it gives us a lot of flexibility in our programming and be like, and and you know gives both of them new things you know additional things that bring people into their spaces. Um, so it, it's really so far. I mean, obviously we're you know it's brand new and mm -hmm. and things change, but so far the relationship um, between all parties is working really well and. You know, I think the question is just how quickly we grow. And, you know, we're, we're fully aware that not everything we, you know, we produced in the Colonial is going to be a home run and make money and keep us in business. And, you know, a lot will depend on how our public support grows. Our, you know, we have basically three sources of funding for the program. We've got, you know, donations, sponsorships, and ticket sales. Um, and, you know, obviously we're hoping there's a balance between all three. Um, the nice part is at the Colonial with 750 seats, you know, if we develop a following, there's a lot of potential ticket revenue to keep us growing. Um, but if not, if as long as there's donors and supporters and sponsors who value what we do and can help us keep, keep the doors open. And by being a part of the mill and the Colonial, the really nice part about it is all the money we're raising really goes straight into our productions. We don't have a lot of overhead because we don't own a space. We don't rent a space. Um, we have access to both facilities and, um, and, but we're not paying for our own phone lines. We're not paying for box office services. We're not paying, you know, for insurance. We're part, we're part of the, um, of the mill. So, um, you know, really everything we have to bring in goes right back out into, into our productions. You guys need help. Is there, uh, it, I mean, you're, you're in deep. It, it, you must, how can, if people want to help you, what, what avenue can they take to, to contact you? Um, sure. So we, we have an email set up powerhouse at bellnetmill.org. Um, you know, we don't have like a storage facility at this point, though we obviously will have to start building up costume and prop and, you know, sets pieces storage at some point. Um, you know, right now we're, we, it's kind of like we have two homes and we have no home because we have no sort of like, you know, base studio or something like a lot of the groups do to keep everything. So, you know, uh, something like that at some point would probably be helpful if there's somebody who has some sort of empty space where we can store things that might be useful. I mean, early on, really what we need is to people to come buy tickets to our shows and spread yeah. the word about them. Um, you know, we you know, that, that's really the best way to help. If you can't come see a show, but can make a donation because you want to see this program succeed, you know, that's the way to do it. Um, but, you know, we, we'd love to be able to say, yeah, we're selling 500 seats of performers at the Colonial. And you know what? We don't really need to bother, you know, you for sponsorship because we're doing okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, that, so I would just say, um, you know, most of the businesses we're talking to are, are wanting to sponsor us right now because they really want the Colonial to succeed. They see what the potential, you know, 
um, that has for uh, sort of bringing a new spark to downtown Laconia. You know, something that's interesting that you, people don't think about is by rehearsing our pr productions in downtown Laconia as well, we're not just bringing people to come to downtown Laconia, you know, Friday, Saturday night, Sunday afternoon, you know, we'll be bringing people Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday yeah. night too, to come to rehearsals. And those people might want to grab a burrito before rehearsal or have yeah. a drink afterwards and stuff. Um, and there's so plenty of parking too with the garage right there, right? I mean, well, yeah. probably people will park uh, behind at the city hall lot, not so necessarily in the garage. I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> Across the street, there's also parking. As but well. there is plenty of parking in, walk, in easy walking distance to the Colonial. Is and the garage not there? Am I, am I wrong? Is the no, garage the not garage is available as well? It, yeah. It's got some structural issues that's been oh. in the paper. Uh, you're not reading, reading the paper enough, but you know, <laughs> they want it. They want to rebuild that at some point because it's one, not so pretty and two, has some structural issues so well um, maybe this will be a some kind of a drive for them that are open so. are safe to you, <laughs> you're right I, I think one of the things is if the colonial is wildly successful and people are coming to downtown regularly that will obviously give the city some reason and confidence that it'd be worth investing in you know more parking for downtown yeah so i i think you you make a really good point that these things will feed each other right the more people the colonial is bringing the more investment the city will, you know, and other businesses will want to make in downtown. Okay, so have we covered everything? Mill? Well, you want to know what shows we're doing? Well, oh, you want, yes, I do. I, yes, I do. I didn't know yeah. you wanted to get into that at this point, but yes, I do. Yeah, so we're, we're announcing next Wednesday at the Mill's annual meeting. So uh, as long as you don't air this till after next Wednesday, we can tell you. Um, so the first we got, you already heard about the first two for the Mill series. Those are both um, the, the playwriting festivals, the Zoom one and the Park one. Um, our August play is, we're starting with a smaller play at the Colonial, which will not be our norm, but we're doing this for a few reasons. We're doing the dinner party by Neil Simon, which is in partnership with the community players at Concord. And there's a couple of reasons we're doing that. One is because I already had a cast in place because I was supposed to do it with Concord last spring at the Hatbox. And uh, we had our read through sort of the night before everything went dark and shut down. So I already had a cast in place. And because it's a small cast and, um, and not such a, a huge show to manage, uh, we thought if for any reason we can't open it in, in August in the Colonial, we, you know, it's a little bit easier to move with less moving pieces. So it's sort of like our soft Colonial opening with a little bit smaller show. Um, then in September, of September, we're doing um, a reading of The Guys by Ann Nelson, which is the story of um, a firefighter who loses a lot of his company on 9-11 and is really struggling to write all these eulogies. And a, um, a writer who is also struggling with the aftermath. The, the aftermath because she's from New York and they pair up together to um, write the eulogies together. So it's sort of like in honor of the fallen heroes of 9 11. And, and it's the 20th anniversary this year, if you can believe that. Mm, geez, that is hard to believe. And, and I didn't see the original one the first time, um, but I heard great things. I mean, great things about it. So it's, I, I'd assume it's just going to be just as great the next time. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice piece. And it just is, a, you know, it's a nice way, I think, to commemorate 9 11 and talk about it without being too traumatizing or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in November is really our first big show. And uh, it's one I'm really excited about because we're going to be doing Our Town, which is my favorite play. And, you know, that's a ex perfect example of a, of a play that, you know, needs 20, 20, 25 people, but could have 50 people in it if, if they wanted to. And I'm going to really encourage that anyone who just wants to be a part of that production, you know, come be in the choir, come be in the in the graveyard scene. Um, find out you know to find out from the inside what it's like to be in a big community theater production even if you're petrified of learning lines or don't even want any lines but um you know i would really love to see i always view that as our sort of our that's our community our first big community building show and obviously it's a play about new hampshire small town community and um you know but it's so relevant to the world at any time and humanity, which is why it gets done so often. Are you going to do that period wise or are you going to do that contemporary? What, what's your goal with that? Uh, no, I'm going to do it period wise. I mean, I think 
what, what I, my feeling on that play is um, the, I don't know how well you know it, Ray, but the scene at the end of act one where Rebecca is talking about this letter that was received in town mm -hmm. that said, you know, I forget the girl's name, but so-and-so, Grover's Corners, New Hampshire, the United States, the world, the universe. And I think that is such the eye of God or something like that. Um, but I, I think that to me, that's sort of the essence of that, that play, even though it's so specific to sort of the time and place it takes place, it is completely relevant to any human being on the planet or in the universe at any place. So it works on a micro level of, of uh, you know, small town New Hampshire and a macro level of, you know, the, the, the mind of God, I think. Mind of God, you're right. Um, you know, it works on both of those levels. So I think by making it specific to the period, it's so easily extractable to anywhere at any time that I don't, I don't see a need to really, you know, muck too much with Wilder's original intent. Yeah, um, it's just a beautiful piece and I'm really looking forward to working on it again. I will say I, I did it 15 years ago and it was a quite well received production of it, but I'm really excited to look at it again because I've changed a lot in 15 years. And I noticed that with a lot of pieces that I, you know, I maybe did at one time in my life and now I see them with a different set of eyes with, you know, I had tiny children when I did it then, and now I have large children. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, I'm feeling every bit of my 47 years now, which, you know, I was Superman and when I was, you know, 31, 32 and did it. So you're, but you're still good looking. So that's good. Thanks, thanks man. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate that. That's why she keeps me. Um, <laughs> oh, that's but, why. Know, so I, I think it's a great piece to revisit it at different at phases of your life because it has different meaning to you depending on where, where you are in things. Absolutely. And I agree with you on that. So I'm super excited to get back into rehearsals on that one. And then we finish with um, a, a show you're very familiar with, um, but Joel Mercier's musical adaptation of A Christmas Carol called yeah. uh, A Christmas Carol, the musical ghost story. And um, that is something we're partnering with, with his theater, NCCA at Gene's Playhouse. And if it, if it does really well and people are excited about it, that's something we're looking to make an annual event. Um, you know, there isn't really an annual Christmas Carol north of Concord. And, you know, Gene's uh, Playhouse is based in Lincoln and obviously we're in the Lakes region. And I, in all my years in the Lakes region, I don't think I've ever seen anybody do a Christmas Carol up here. So- um, Is that you know, right? All the productions that people do? Yeah, I can't think of one. I mean, I you know, Joel Joel did his in Concord, and Andrew Pinard does one at Hatbox in the Concord. Playoffs and did a reading. And the Palace does uh, uh, does you know Christmas Carol every year down in Manchester, and Peacock Players does it in Nashua every few years. But I can't think of any groups that do it up up further north of Concord. Wow. So. Wow. so we're excited about that, and you know, that's another example of you know why collaborations work well too. You know, I'll be busy with our town for November and Joel will be, you know, you know, we're, we're co-producing it with Jeans, but Joel's directing and, and music directing it. And, you know, he'll be taking point on, on leading that one. So even though we're sort of working on two things at once, we're adding, you know, through collaboration, we're finding, uh, you know, different people to take point on the different things. So is, is Joel's um, collaboration with you the, the first group to collaborate with you in, in this year or well, was there someone else yeah community players of conquer we're working with them on both the right. festival as well as the dinner party right sorry i forgot about that so you know I, 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 and you know there are plenty of there are plenty of plays we want to do by ourselves um you know uh, we don't know how often we'll collaborate specifically on plays a lot of the collaborations we're looking to do are going to be things we can't do by ourselves that's sort of the point like um you know, with Lake Street and Symphony Orchestra, we're talking about doing like a concert version of a musical in front of their big orchestra. You know, that's not something we could do by ourselves. Um, so when we're collaborating in general, we're going to look for ways to collaborate with uh, on projects that the talents or the expertise of the of the groups we're collaborating with uh, make it different from just another community theater production that we could have produced ourselves. Mm. So that gets us to December. Are, are you? Anything projected for after December, potentially? I mean, are you working on next season in the back oh, of yeah. your mind? Um, yeah. So, so as we said, this is our, our season is going to be calendar year. So this is our, that's our 2021 season, three events for the mill series, three events for the colonial series, 
we're putting together the 2022 season now, um, but we haven't locked anything in yet. So there's nothing we can announce, but um, the, right now we're planning five in each series for 2022. So that will really be our first full season where we're testing, you know, is, is 10 things to produce in a year too much or, or can we handle that? But we, you know, being our first full year, we wanted to sort of go for it and see what we can, what, what we're able to do. And I think, you know, the, the success of our 2021 will go a long way to inspiring us with confidence or not for yeah. what we're able to accomplish in 2022. Do you want other groups to reach out to you for 2022 to start that process? Or do you just want to wait until you see what happens in 2021? We want to talk to groups at any time, whether we want to plan something for 2022 or we say, hey, this you bring this to the table and we bring this, let's work together. And we, you know, some of the things we're talking about are further down the road and some of the things are shorter term. Right, like like the orchestra already has their 2022 year plan. So we're talking, if this is gonna happen with the orchestra, that would be 2023. Uh, we're talking to the high schools about 2022. We're talking to the dance companies about 2022. Um, I mean, I think it all, you know, we're a absolutely always gonna be happy to have a conversation. You know, that's part of the fun of this, this business is meeting, different artists and, and with different talents and different knowledge and different ideas and seeing what works. Um, so yeah, we're always happy to talk, but you know, um, we're, we are planning long-term. So it's a question of when it would fit and, and be mutually beneficial in, our, in the schedules. I don't want to put a hex on anybody. Um, and I certainly hope I don't, but the hat box. I'm not sure what's going on down there. I'm going to talk to Andrew, I, I hope, in, in a week or so. Do you see um, something similar to that where, where you are helping groups that, I don't even know how to put this, you know, they, they fill a slot down there, they fill a need. And it seems like you could kind of be in that same boat where you could help out these groups to... I, I see us as more of a more collab more collaborative okay. um, in that occasionally hatbox produces something on its own um but but i i see us as as working with another group like we're working with um concord right now to co to, to bring is for each group to bring something to the table not just you know um a space and the and the infrastructure um, yeah. of the box office and things like that. I, I think the key difference between what we're doing in Hatbox is, you know, Hatbox has a space that's open all year and needs needs people to bring in, you know, product uh, productions to work in that space so they can fill their calendar. Right. Colonial is a little bit different because we're not actually managing the Colonial calendar. Um, Spectacle is the one who's managing the calendar and will have their own events to put in, our events to put in, and then other than that, we'll be renting it to groups. So groups, you know, um, you know, a, a group that uses the hat box could use the Colonial, but they have to, you know, rent it in a different way. At the hat box, it's a box office split based on, uh, you know, revenue. At the Colonial, it's going to be a rental fee to, you know, you know, to rent the space for a week. But that's the key difference. We don't have a calendar to fill. Mm -hmm. We just have our five weeks to do, you know, to do with as we please. Um, and the rest of the calendar is managed by Spectacle as opposed to Hatbox, which has its whole year to fill. Is that uh, your five week thing? Is that, is that very similar to, are you doing something similar at the mill? You have so many weeks there that you. No, I mean, the mill, the mill is sort of just, uh, we can, as long, you know, m most of their, the, the performance event space, you know, they, they do a lot of weddings in non COVID times, you know, so most Saturdays are taken up by weddings. So like if we're doing a reading, we'll do a Friday night, Sunday afternoon, so they can have the wedding on the Saturday. And then we, you know, put our stuff back out for Sunday. Um, so for the mill, it's like, as we have um, projects that we want to do there, as long as the space is available, we, you know, we can, we can book it and use it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we think five is about the right number for for both spaces, uh, at least to start with. Yeah, good, good. So right. now it's just a case of getting, you know, the the most talented community actors in New Hampshire, like yourself, to come <laughs> audition. So we can have, uh, you know, really... doesn't stop. He doesn't stop. <laughs> well, you know, Ray. You know, I know you like to be flattered, and I know you like to be courted. <laughs> 
So I'm just telling you, the invitation is open for you. Anytime you want, you come out for one of our powerhouse. Thanks. Thanks. So um, where are you guys going to be? You're just going to be posting on Facebook all the time. Where are you going to be? Where's everything going to? So yes, we have a Facebook page. um, That's already active. Okay. So you can find Powerhouse Theater Collaborative on Facebook. Um, You could also sign up for the mill um, newsletter. So bell that mill dot org and there's a place to sign up for the newsletter um and then we also will be posting those things on the website we are under the belknap mill website there's a section for powerhouse and um so we'll we'll sprinkle them in all those places okay. and we'll tell you and you can shout it around too well, we'll keep doing podcasts about it i hope it turns out to be great i really do i really do um because just to get some life up there you know is so important. I, I drive through and I, it's sad, you know, to see so many businesses that slots that are open for businesses and stuff. And I really do hope that it brings life down there. Well, based on, the, based on the excitement of the people we've been talking to, I, I think there's going to be an early rush to check it out once it opens and people are going to be really excited. And then I think it's up to us in spectacle to make sure that the programming is quality programming so that people will want it to continue to come. Yeah. If that happens, then we will see those storefronts filling up and new businesses coming in and businesses staying open in the evening because they know there's going to be traffic. Um, you know, that was the dream of BDC and the city of Laconia when, when they started this thing, you know, five or six years ago, you know, their dream was that, once this opens, it will become like the anchor tenant, I think they call it, you know, for driving a lot of people to come to downtown Lacona. And we should say um, it was also David Bound's dream that this would happen. And we um, we're really sorry that he's not around to, to see it opening. And we are um, dedicating our first season to to David. Oh, that's nice. I was shocked. I didn't even know. I found out like rumor or something. I saw something on Facebook. I. I didn't even know he was sick or I don't even know how he passed away, but no, all of a sudden I see he's gone. And, and we're really sad that he can't. He yeah. Can't. I mean, that that's the real thing. You know, he worked for so many years to see this thing, you know, come to fruition and, and it's, it's, you know, definitely saddens us that he won't, he won't get to see it open, but you know, our little part is to dedicate our season to him and make sure people know that he did make an important contribution to, to making sure the arts came back to life in Laconia. Great. Great. Did we miss anything? I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know, like um, Spectacles working on their web web presence, the mills working on their web presence, um, you know, people who want to find things to do in downtown Laconia, those will be the two, the two venues that are really doing uh, a lot of different events. And, you know, we didn't even touch on, the mill has so many programs besides the arts, um, uh, historical and, you know, it's a museum. The powerhouse where we take our name from is still intact and you can see, you know, the old big wheel and the old uh, electric trans, I don't know the right term, the transformer wall with the, you know, the levers and stuff. And yeah. you can see the you can see the one that you would have clicked if you wanted to divert power to the town, you know, from the mill. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of neat to think about that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a cool place to they visit. Have a lot of music there as well. Um, right now they have a, um, um they have an online music series while well we can't get together in person and then there's a summer concert series that's free Outdoors. in the park so yeah you should definitely check out belknapmill.org and, and i see. had no idea honest to god i had no yeah. idea till i went well, to right the now room. i didn't even know it existed right now we're working on the new website so um if you go there it says check us out soon but on the 17th we will we will launch the website and you'll get to see how really how many programs there are there. It's quite a busy place. Actually, one other thing I want to pitch to you, because I, I mentioned this to you briefly, but so here's a really good example of the synergy of, of you know, us, us working as part of the mill. Um, the mill's big educational program is called the Industrial Heritage Program. And I, p- people watching the, uh, may have heard of this, but every year, fourth graders from all over the state take a field trip to the mill and they get the experience of a day in the life of a mill worker. Um, and uh, it focuses it, on 1918 when the Belknap Mill was making socks for the army. 
in World War I. Mm. Um, so they have volunteers who man different stations to show the different jobs of the mill and the kids get assigned a little costume and a name and a job. So they go learn their job and then see how it all goes together. And then they get a dime. And then they get a dime as their pay for the end of the day. So like our daughters, did, when they were in fourth grade, they went to it. And one of our daughters, I think she still remembers the name she yeah. was given and stuff. And so this has been a, an ongoing, I think 25, 25 years. years program for fourth graders in New Hampshire. And then obviously last year with COVID, uh, they couldn't do it. And this year with COVID, they're not gonna be able to bring kids into the mill. They're doing it semi-virtually. So, so in one of our meetings, we discussed, well, what, what could we do to, um, you know, to, to provide this experience for the kids who are missing it over these two years? And so we're actually, Johan and I are, we took the material for the, um, for the, what the volunteers use to explain the jobs and their characters and stuff. And we're turning it into a, a video script. So we're gonna be producing, uh, we're applying to the New Hampshire Humanities Council for a grant. And we're gonna be producing a video of, that sort of recreates in, in movie form the experience of the kids when they come to the mill. That's and brilliant. what we realized is, now, this won't just be useful for COVID. This actually allows the mill to expand this program to anywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, because it's got an educational packet that goes with the live experience that can just as easily go with the video experience. So now, besides only having, you know, schools, fourth grades within driving distance to Laconia that have the money to afford a bus and to pay for a field trip, having access to this program. Now, any school anywhere in the world who wants to learn about industrial heritage of, of New England and, and factory life could rent this program for their classrooms, get a you know an educational teacher packet to go with it, and bring the down that mill experience to the classroom. It really so, is brilliant, really. So anyway, I'm going to hit you up to play a role in it once um, <laughs> once the uh, once the grant funding comes through because we, we definitely can't worry about my heart. About <laughs> I'm going to use that as an excuse. <laughs> What's that? My heart. Oh, come on. <laughs> Your heart's in the right place. There's, there's no yelling in the piece either. Uh, no, I really think it's a great idea, though. I mean, it looks like a documentary, right? At that point. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll see. We'll have two child, you know, fourth grade ish child actors sort of the becoming the stand ins for the kids. And we'll see this program through their eyes. Uh, what you know sort of go through the experience through their eyes as a, as a stand-in um, and you know we'll see it's uh, you know we're not quite there yet we're hoping to film this summer or fall if we get the grant but you know it's just what we what Johan and I have found since we joined the mill and and started talking with Spectacle is you know right up our alley is using theater to find ways to communicate and participate and and share share our talents with the with you know the community and whether it's video, whether it's a big production, whether it's a reading and discussion, this is exactly what we like to do and how we like to use theater. And so you know we're finding through the different groups we're talking with and through the different uh, think the mill programs that we're you know we're, we're integrating with, you know just a lot of new different ways for us to sort of expand our horizons and, and our talents. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad. It seems like a great fit for you. I mean, it really does. You're very comfortable with it at this point. It's not like you're frazzled and you well know. we haven't done anything yet so it's easy to be confident. <laughs> but when the first three productions sell 50 tickets and uh, we might be more frazzled then. oh been through that sure been through that and less tickets. but you know like like any theater except the fact that we don't have a track record um you know because we're brand new you know navigating the post-covid theater world is going to be something we all have to get through. I mean, yeah. just because the governor may say, yeah, you can have 500 people in, inside of the colonial, doesn't mean they're gonna be 500 people willing to come sit next, you know, right. shoulder, shoulder with their neighbor right. who they don't know in the colonial. So we'll just have to see. Yeah, yeah. Oof, boy, talk about flying blind. I mean, it's really gonna be very interesting to see what happens. I know a lot of groups have, I've been kind of following along, a lot of groups are trying to open up. Just, we don't know. If, the audience is going to be there i don't well I don't that's what we do. have the advantage that we don't have history that we can really wait till we feel it's safe to do sort of our first big grand opening production because yeah. 
why you know why waste a big splash in a, you know in a little pond if uh, if people aren't ready to come out yet and you're not worried like you said before about overhead you don't have a building you don't have to worry about rent you don't have to worry about electricity yeah, we're lucky in that way right now yeah yeah yeah, yeah that, that's the, i mean to, you know realistically that's how we're able to make this thing conceivably work in that we can spend on our productions because that's what we're putting our money into money into not into rent not into phone lines and internet right. and all that stuff um, so we're lucky that way. Um, that's all thanks to the mill being, uh, you know, taking us under their wing and, and providing a home base for us. Um, and, you know, so we're excited about that relationship and we're, our fingers are crossed that our, we can make the program sustainable. This month is membership month at the mill. So you can go to their website and become a member and then Good support plug. all their different programs. Good plug. Good plug. <laughs> yes. Nice. Nicely done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anything else that needs to come up? Phone numbers, emails. We did some websites. Anything you need? Yeah, bellnetmill.org and, and powerhouse at bellnetmill.org if you want to send us an email. Okay. And uh, the Facebook page is Powerhouse Theater Collaborative. That's the bulk of our presence right now. But by the time this airs next week, we'll have a website uh, uh, as part of the Mills webpage. And uh, we'll be good to go. We're, mm -hmm. we're excited to get started. And we're, we're patiently waiting. But like you said, you know, since we can't actually do anything but plan, we're doing a lot of planning. I've already got, you know, working on 2022 and 2023. And Jahan doesn't even know I've started to pencil a few things in for 2024. So, but I it's got a secret. She won't I'm know. retired by then. That seems like a long way away. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, my mind goes. It's what I do. I, yeah, I, like I know. It. I know.